Hello everyone, I'm Bradley Sward, Assistant Professor of Computer Information Systems at the College of DuPage in Glen Ellyn, Illinois. And today we're going to take a look at a lecture called The Basic Questions and Answers about Assembly Language and Virtual Machine Concepts. So the first thing I want to do is talk about the background that you need to have in order to be successful in this class. So uh, I'm presuming that you've taken either the Introduction to C++ or the Introduction to Java a little more than just our CIS 1400, the logic class, the class you learned Python in. So we're going to be teaching you know, how to do for loops, how to do while loops. We're not teaching what a for loop is, what a while loop is. So I just want to make sure that you have an understanding that this is meant to be a late second year, early third year course in computer science here at this college. Um, and I just want to make sure you're in the right place. So that said, if you are watching this video, you more than likely have the competing resources needed for the hardware and software needs of this course. So from a hardware standpoint, any PC, any laptop that can run Visual Studio will work. I will give you the additional software that you need, because uh, Visual Studio is a free download, of course, from Microsoft. And then I will give you a package that can run the MASM portion of a, you know, the assembly language portion in Visual Studio and that's pretty much all you need to make things run. Um, software, any, you know, a browser, if you're, again, if you're watching this, yep, you have a browser so that you can maybe go online and look for help when you need help for the things you're going to be doing. So then we will find that in this uh, Visual Studio and MASM environment, we could produce three different types of assembly language programs, executable versions from this setup. And the first one is basically the one we're going to mainly focus on, 32-bit protected mode. So in that mode, we have our little walled garden, just like any other program that runs in a modern environment. You know, we have our memory, we have our program running, we can access stuff inside of that little ball, but anything outside of that should crash our operating system, crash the, crash the program immediately. There is an ability to run this in 64-bit mode, which is a little more, you know, a little more modern day. However, we're still not going to focus on that. That would add a little more complication to a lot of what we're learning. And the 32-bit protected mode is the best way to go about making, giving you the learning environment you need. But uh, as you'll see if you look through, depending on the PowerPoints that you end up looking through, 64-bit mode isn't overly difficult once you get over that hurdle of using different registers for 64-bit versus 32. And then the third different type of program is a 16-bit real address mode. This is you know, basically 20, 25 years ago when I, was, <laughs> when I was much younger. And that's the system that I grew up with where you basically have access, full access to all of your RAM at any given time. There, you know, there is very little restriction in that regard. And with that, since it's 16-bit, you don't have access to a lot of the registers that you would have access to in the, the modern day, the 32 and or the 64-bit environment. We would also have to add quite a few MASM directives and specific code to run in the 16-bit environment, and stuff that was very common 25 years ago, but is absolutely unheard of today. So in that regard, we're not going to be using that in this class, and again, we're going to focus mainly on the 32-bit protected mode. We might talk about the others a little bit, but that's what we'll be using. So I'm hoping you can fill in the gaps for what you'll be learning here in this class assembly language. But, you know, basic principles of computer architecture, we're going to be talking about that. You're going to see at a low level how everything kind of communicates and works together to get the job done. And especially in these first few weeks, we're going to be taking a lot of looks at Boolean logic, true-false statements, because, of course, at the end of the day, that's what an if statement is. That's what a for loop uses to determine that it's done looping, those kind of things, these Boolean true-false statements. So it makes sense we understand that. So then we're also going to take a look at high-level languages versus low-level languages, maybe not directly, but absolutely you will appreciate the C++, the Python, the Java, you name the language these days that runs on top of this assembly language that we don't have to worry about in, unless we so choose. And as we will see, at least in this lecture, if you took you know, an idea in English, I want to multiply something together. I want to multiply two numbers on a computer. Well, that idea goes from 
your idea in your head to some programming language like C++ or Java, which then gets worked down, at least in C++, down to pure assembly language. And then that assembly language can be converted down into pure machine language. And then that machine language needs to be run directly on the hardware of the computer that we're working with. So then to finish up this little talk about these kind of things, then it makes sense that you're learning assembly language to be an overall better programmer because, again, in this lecture we're going to see that there are so many tools that take your idea from thought in your head down to machine language. You know, these are general tools. We're going to have to find a way eventually to find ways to speed up bottlenecks or reduce memory footprints, things that the compiler will do for us that we're not expecting to happen um, because it's a general purpose program and maybe we'll have to work it down at the assembly language level to make it more efficient. Plenty of people are programming in assembly language, some form of assembly language to this day, and maybe it surprises you because you don't think about it, but I certainly got hit with it while I was interviewing for jobs four or five years ago when it came to like what is the industry looking for more and more these days. So, you know, business applications, you know, maybe not so much, but you know, there are businesses that will rely on you writing some assembly language for the things that we do. You know, you guys hopefully won't avoid that, especially now that you're going to become experts in that field. So hardware device drivers are also something that you need, to, you know, people have to program for. That video card, that massive video card, needs some kind of program that communicate with the operating system or any program running so that it can do its job because it's a separate piece of hardware working with the CPU. So somebody has to write that code and you better believe that that code has to be efficient and tight so that it can run as best as possible under the conditions that it's running. So many jobs were asking me during interviews and just phone interviews and whatnot about my embedded my embedded experience and at that time all I had done was work a little bit with Raspberry Pi, a little bit with Arduino. I had not worked with this out in the field so those interviews got a little you know got a little short there after I would describe that I don't have much experience with embedded systems. So an embedded system of course is something like a toaster, your microwave oven, something like that. Someone has to code for that, someone has to program that thing to work and you better believe it's probably written in assembly language unless someone put a $300 you know, microprocessor or CPU inside of that thing, which is not very likely.